Okay, everyone, thank you for your patience. This is Hudson Harris going to be talking about the wrath of the audits, HIPAA compliance. Um, thank you for your patience again. I had to get the video reg set up and going, and we're running. We're good. Uh, thank you again. Hello, everybody. You know, it's funny. I always wanted to do stand-up comedy. I just flew in from Cleveland, and man, are my arms tired. <laughs> Um, my name is Hudson Harris. Uh, big thank you to ShowMeCon. Um, really happy to be here. What we are going to talk about today is HIPAA 2015, Wrath of the Audits. Um, as many of you may know, the game has changed substantially. Um, there's a big feeling in the InfoSec industry that compliance doesn't matter, HIPAA may not matter. Um, that may have been true up until the end of last year. But with the beginning of last year, HIPAA matters, and it should matter to all of us. And if you need a drink before we go through all of this, that's fine. We can get a little hair blowback in this, but it's okay, because we got this. This is my son. This is the I got this pose. So the first thing that we've got are audits. At the end of 2014, about five or six, 700,000 companies got letters from the Office of Civil Rights, the OCR. Those letters said that you are going to be audited in our first annual 10% audit of every covered entity in the United States. Along with that, those people had to identify their business associates, and 5% of every business associate is now going to be audited on an annual basis. Completely random, completely proactive, not conditioned upon a breach or security incident. So that right there, the game has completely, totally changed from any other time before. So, when to look for these letters. These letters came out at the end of last year. They got a big bunch of funding. And then May 4th, the Office of the National Controller dropped the audit guidelines. 90 days out is their general time frame in the past, which means that August 4th, these audits are going to start rolling through. Everybody else will get their new letters in December or January, the end of this year, beginning of next year. And we will see this on a routine basis. And the funding has quadrupled for next year under several proposed budgets to go for this. So, breaches. Who here got a letter from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, Primara, Connexion, or any other healthcare company about their data being stolen? It's amazing. The entire time that we've been recording HIPAA breaches, all the data available, about 22 million people have lost their information. The first six months of this year, there have been over 100 million records stolen. 100 million individuals, that's almost one out of three people in the United States. These are children, adults, all types of people. What this means is that the news cycle is eating this up like crazy. And so Congress is going to have to start doing stuff about it. States are doing stuff about it. Texas, California, Missouri, Illinois, all have HIPAA, HIPAA compliance legislation on the, on the slate. Some of it's already passed. Some states like Texas have expanded who covered entities are to basically cover anybody that touches or looks at PHI. So it's getting worse. More people are getting impacted. So one of the big things that people ask me is, is well, why do people want my health record? What does it matter? So it takes about five bucks for one credit record on the dark web. For those of you who are there on the second, on the keynote today, it's about five dollars, give or take, for a credit record. It is 10 to 15 times more valuable on the dark web for a personal health record. It is up to $65 per person for your PHI because there's so much more they can do with it. They can get drugs, medical devices. The days of just opening up a credit card account for $1,500 to $2,000 are long gone. You have people that are, will take out medications in your name, Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud. It's so much more money on the table. Your health information is worth a lot. So then we have enforcement. Enforcement is where things really start to get hairy. So we have the fines. Everybody's familiar with the fines. If you breach or if you lose records or if they're hacked, you're generally assessed a fine. It can be $1,500 per violation with a cap of $1.5 million, depending upon the severity and whether you knew about it. That's child's play. Anthem, with 100 million individuals with their information stolen, the way that lawyers calculate how much that is, it's $100 per person for credit monitoring for five years and notification. That means a trillion dollars 
just to get just to get the credit monitoring taken care of. A trillion dollars, that's company ending stuff. On top of that, states are rapidly expanding exactly what you are liable for. That's why OU. This is no longer company liability. There are personal rights of action in 26 out of 50 states. That means that you as the data controller, you as the tech with the laptop with the information, you as the IT administrator, the choices you make and what your company does can directly impact you in personal lawsuits. On top of that, we have jail time. This is true. California passed a law. There was an individual, he was fired from a doctor's office. He decided to get a nice bottle of Chianti, some Chinese food, and go home after he was fired and browse the medical records of the rich and famous. For a month, no one shut down his access. So he went, looked at all this information. He never shared it, he never captured it, he never took pictures of it, he never printed it, he never sold it. He lost his license to practice medicine for life in the state of California, $250,000 fine and jail for six months. Jail. They weren't even harmed, but they looked at it. So jail time, personal rights of action, and big, big dollars. So. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run through the three, what I call the three episodes of HIPAA. We're gonna do a, the documentation. These are the nuts and bolts. This part is particularly boring. I will do my best to make it short, sweet, and we can talk later if you want, but it's critical. The next part of the security risk assessment, we're gonna talk about what a security risk assessment needs at a base level. We're gonna run through a couple hypos, and then we're gonna talk about the HIPAA compliant theories of application development. These are my, what I like to give my clients for how to think about privacy. So the first thing is what is the goal? What are we trying to do here? What we're trying to create is a culture of compliance. It's getting people to think about privacy not only in their own lives but in how they handle their clients data. Because the truth is is that too many clients and too many people that I've talked to believe that the HIPAA thing is a shift. That we're going to start here, and then we're going to work our way here, and we're going to roll this out, and we'll end up over here at this compliant environment in a year or two. Once you know something's wrong, if you don't do anything about it, the fines can triple, quadruple. In states with punitive damages, they get even worse. This is a culture pivot, not a shift. And a lot of the suggestions that we've heard over the past couple of days, I loved the idea of the IT people putting the card on someone's desk to lock their screen. The social engineering guys from the Office of Civil Rights are just as nasty and just as sneaky as the people that talked on the first day. And they will do anything to get into your office. Maybe not climb up four stories and go in through an air duct, but who knows. So what we're gonna talk about first are the documentation. And let me tell you why this is important. It'll go fast, it won't be too painful. But documentation, when you get an audit from the Office of Civil Rights, you have two weeks on average to respond. You can't make up documentation in two weeks. This is for a proactive audit. Reactive audits, meaning you had a security incident, can be 24 hours or less. You have to have this documentation ready. You have to have this documentation on hand and ready to just go, here you go. Yes, bad things happened or no bad things did not happen, but here's all of our documentation and please leave us alone, thank you, goodbye. After something has happened or after you've gotten the letter, it's too late. You're out of compliance already. So the first group of policies are the breach policies. Breach response is just that. Security incident occurs, how do we respond to it? Who's notified, when are they notified? There was a, a, a talk given by the Office of Civil Rights. They said, you know, one of the first things we do is Google a company and privacy officer when we're gonna audit. Who do I talk to? Because all of that should just be obvious knowledge. Should be on your website, plastered all over it. Questions, comments, cigars, cigarettes, whatever it is, privacy officer, here. Because if they can't find that person, oh boy, they start faxing you or they'll email you or they'll send a carrier pigeon or something to try and find your privacy officer. So the breach response is everybody in the company needs to know, who do I call? because the Office of Civil Rights is known to randomly dial within a company to say, if you have a, if, who do I talk to if I have a problem with my privacy? Everybody should know. From the beginning of the company to the end, receptionist to doctors, everybody should know the name of the person and how to get in touch with them. I highly recommend the really simple email of privacyofficer at companyname.com. 
because then everybody knows what it is no matter who that name is or who, who they have changed or been promoted to. The next one is assessments. Super important. You get an incident, you have a duty to actually fill out a piece of paper that talks about who was impacted, why they were impacted, what happened, how it happened, how long it went on, how did you shut it down, what is your assessment of what happened. If you don't have this, when they come along, you get fined. And then the last one is breach notification. So you've gone through the security incident, you figured out that something went wrong, and you're like, okay, how do we tell people? If it's over 500 people, we're calling up channel five and we're letting them know. We're gonna call the Office of Civil Rights. If it's under 500, we're gonna go deliver the letters, we're gonna put them in the mail, we're gonna tell them what happened. But you have to have that step by step, all the way through. The next one, privacy policies. We're just about halfway through. This is how we safeguard our clients' PHI. This is how we disclose our PHI and how we can then use that PHI to make our companies better. One of the biggest misnomers of HIPAA is that it's meant to just clamp everything down and it's just a vault and nobody ever sees this data or uses it and nobody should ever share it. How many people here have heard from their doctor, we can't do that because of HIPAA? Anybody? I can't give you your record because of HIPAA. I'm going to tell you that's a lie. It is your information. You get to do what you want with it, when you want with it, how you want with it. So if your doctor has said that, say, I don't believe you. Because they do have to give you your information. And if you want to disclose it, they have forms for that. If you want to give someone your information, you have control over it, not them. But the key with this, this is where your workforce training comes in. These are not your tech people. These are your clinicians. These are, these are the soft and fuzzies. These are the people that are working with your clients on a daily basis and dealing with that data and how we process it. The next one is the real meat. This is what interests most people here. These are the security policies. These are a beast. Usually 50, 60, 70 pages for a mid-size organization, 50 to 75 policies, ranging on everything from workforce management and access, that's hire, fire, promote, the whole life cycle of an employee. How do, do we do background checks on them? Do we just give anybody access? Do they have to take HIPAA training before we give them email? Those types of things are all addressed here. Disaster recovery and business continuity, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but fire, flood, or blood, how does your business react and keep access to people's information for them when they need it and how they need it? We also have access protection. This is physical and digital. How do people get into the records room? How do people get access? Do we have an unsecured FTP server? Do we do use VPNs? What do we use to keep people's information safe when we're transmitting it? And then finally, use. That's workstation, email. How big are your passwords? How complex are they? Are you resetting them every so often? What can you do at your workstation? What can't you do at your workstation? Those types of policies. The important thing to remember is that if you take into account how much money people can make, it's no longer a question of if you will get attacked. It is no longer a question of whether or not someone will get into your system. I can promise you, they will. Has anybody ever heard of extortionware? Okay, so most people should be familiar with this, but if you're not, this is how it works. One of these unsavory individuals comes into your company, they get a whole bunch of client files, and they screen cap it and send it to you. This will be $30,000, please. And this is so common and so routine now that there is actual insurance now under cyber insurance for extortion. When someone has come in, hacked through it, and then you have to pay them to get this information back. You know what they say about blackmail for photos, there's always the negatives. So no matter what you do or what you pay, you're always gonna continue to pay. So we have to start thinking about this in a proactive way. So the last step of all this documentation is an ongoing HIPAA calendar. The gentleman from Schnooks today had a great view of how you work through to get your program rolled out. That should continue throughout the year. Regular training, persistent alerts, disaster recovery and business continuity on a tabletop basis. Like, you need to get your people around the table and create what you need to figure out how we respond. If our building burns down, how do we protect our information? If our colo goes down, how do we come up in another site? You have a duty under HIPAA to actually go through these exercises. Whether you do it cold or whether you do it live, you have to do it. And the last one is the security risk assessment, which is what episode two focuses on. The security risk assessment is really the meat of the security rule under HIPAA. This is where everybody in this room should be able to walk through this in their sleep by the time they get back to the office tomorrow, hopefully. But it's not too complicated, it's just time consuming. So I like to think of this in a fun way. 
I like to treat this like D&D. Here we go. So what we do, the first thing, we baseline our system. The way that we baseline our system is we get a list of all of our assets. Anything PHI touches, anything, goes on that list. That's anything that processes, stores, or transmits. So this whole process was created by NIST. And NIST created, and we'll talk about it, a product that guides you step by step through the security risk analysis and everything you need. This guideline is the same one that the Office of Civil Rights, the Attorney General, and anybody who is coming after you is going to use. Hell, even Parameter, they use the same checklist that the Office of Civil Rights uses. So use it. Leverage it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to baseline the system. So we're going to get a spreadsheet. And on this side are all of our assets. Okay? So everything, servers, routers, phones, tablets, uh, let's go, uh, switches. And then we go and we ID the threats. This is every nasty, imaginable thing you can imagine. SQL injection, someone picked up a thumb drive, did your employee scan a QR code, I sur surfed the dark web at work, why was that a bad thing? All of those things. Every threat you can imagine with your people around the table in the next column. These are all your threats. Then, this is the hard part, why is our system vulnerable? What are the vulnerabilities of our system that we know about? Because I can guarantee that there's not a person in this room who doesn't think, you know, everything I have is perfectly secure. Nope, yep, no, we're good. Yeah, everything's patched, everything's up to date, totally cool. It's not true. So identify those vulnerabilities. But you have to take the ego out of it. You really have to just say, okay, this is where we're vulnerable. Because a lot of times there's reasons you're vulnerable. I can't tell you how many people are like, well, I can't patch that. Well, why not? Well, my vendor won't let me. Well, shit, okay, well, let's isolate it. Let's put it on its own network. Let's, let's get it out of there. I work with a company that has, has to submit billing through IE8. IE8, that's actually a browser for the internet used to download Chrome or Mozilla, depending. So we also, we go through all these vulnerabilities. That's the next column. So we have baseline, threats, vulnerabilities, and then all of our current controls. This is where everybody gets to get proud and happy. Is everything we've put in place to keep all these people out, all these threats at bay. This, is, this, is, this can be policy, so we patch when we can. This can be actual controls of, you know, we do multi-layered defense. We have active pen testing. You know, we do all those types of things to monitor, log monitoring. Anything that you do in place right now to keep your shit safe is what goes there. Then we do likelihood. This is where things get a little more challenging. So the way that likelihood works is you then take all those vulnerabilities and say, how likely is it that someone's going to hit this? And you assign it a value, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, or 1. And then that goes next to all of those vulnerabilities. Then we go through and we look at impact. We say, OK, if this goes down, how bad is this? If I lose a chat server, that's bad. Business still goes forward. If I'm a telemedicine company and someone takes down my video conferencing server, my Jabber server, that's, that's, that'd be 100. You, then you, so then you assign a 10, a 50, or a 100 on the impact side. That's the next column. The final step is we do the risk determination. The risk determination is the likelihood times the impact. And then you get a final number. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be completely accurate. It has to be close. Because if something happens and the Office of Civil Rights sends their auditors in, you need to have this. Because then what you do is you use that nifty Excel feature where you sort based upon value, and everything with the highest impact goes up top, and that's, that's where you start. You start from the top down. So if you know you've got something with a high impact, a high vulnerability, a high likelihood, you start, to, you start working on that first. Because it gives you the ability that if something goes wrong that's way down on the list, and the Office of Civil Rights says, hey, well, why didn't you fix this? Oh, well, we did this really cool security risk analysis that NIST put out and told us to do, and look, it was at the bottom. Oh, so you did think about it. OK. Because most of the time, the Office of Civil Rights is looking to make sure that you documented, you evaluated, and you analyzed. So this isn't going to protect you from lawsuits. But it will protect you from the hefty fines, the settlement agreements, all that type of stuff that comes from the Office of Civil Rights. And believe me, they can be onerous. So let's run through a couple of quick hypotheticals. So we have a client database. 
We ID the threat. Hackers target the system. Dark hats, sunglasses, laptop in a coffee, coffee shop. And they're going after our vulnerability, which is an unsecured, unencrypted Windows 2012 server. Has our client database. So our current controls, we have a non-hardened firewall, so factory settings. It's password protected, but it's an admin login from a web base. So the likelihood of someone attacking this, let's give it a medium, say 0.5. Maybe higher, but let's start let's, for the sake of argument. The impact of losing that would be 100. This is what happened to Anthem. Anthem lost our client database, and we'll talk about why that's so important later. But we do our risk determination, a 0.5 times 100 gives us a 50. So then that goes on our chart. And it's as simple as that, and you do it for every asset. It is a lot of work, but once you have it, you just update it. New equipment, you update it. So part of it is just that ground level. This is my cat tax slide. This cat is very healthy and very happy, just not very pretty. Uh, so we have a hackers target a social media site for cat lovers. Our vulnerability is it's an unsecured HTTP server, and it is only password protected. The likelihood of going after an unsecured HTTP server is pretty high. We'll give that a one. The impact, though, would be low. Everybody's cat pictures are already on the internet. More stolen cat pictures is not that big of a deal. So our risk determination would give us a 10 low down on the totem pole, not very important. So once you've done all this, we go through the post-mortem. This is where you say, okay, here's our sheet, this is everything we did, now how do we make our controls better? So don't just roll over at this point, go back through and say, we could have prevented this by doing this, we could have worked through this by doing this, and it's a really good idea to get somebody to come in and attack your system, third-party audits are amazing. If you're doing an internal audit, you should stop and get somebody else to do it because we, as humans, naturally black out stuff that we don't want to pay attention to and we will be generous and friendly with ourselves. You don't want that. You want that stack. You want that big report to come in to say, these are the things you have to improve. Finally, you document everything. You go through all of it. You figure out, this is, this is what we did. This is all of our security risk analysis and we'll update it again in six months or at the next big equipment rollout. And it's really, really important to go through this continually. If you, have a, if you have an incident, you need to do it again. If you have an incident where something went through that you missed, you need to do it again. The one that a lot of InfoSec people love to argue with me about is Anthem. They shouldn't have encrypted, or they should have encrypted. Well, they shouldn't have done this, or they should have done that. The problem with Anthem is not that they were hacked, and it's not that they were unencrypted. The problem is this was the second time in 2009, they lost a quarter million records through an unsecured, unencrypted server through an through a expired server certificate. Six years later, a hundred million records through an unencrypted database that was 10 years old, and this is the kicker. They had 88 million records of their own clients, birth date, uh, medical information, social security, uh, address, they had 10 million employee records. Employees, salary, title, position, home address. They had three or four million uncomplete, incomplete insurance applications. People that weren't even their clients. Also on that server, and the one that blew my mind is they had 10 million records of Blue Cross Blue Shield clients that weren't even theirs. So they had a hundred million records. Some of them weren't even their clients, some of them weren't anybody's clients, on a non-segregated database with just everybody on it. Someone made the decision after 2009 that not only were they not going to encrypt, but that they were going to keep all this data together. That requires a security risk assessment. You have to have a policy in place as to why you chose to not only keep records that were that old, but why you chose to keep records that were that old of all these different entities on an unencrypted server that was that old. So here's the thing. A lot of companies say, well, we can't use data that's encrypted. If it's live, it has to be unencrypted. That's true to an extent, but you don't need data that's that old. There's stuff on it that should have been archived a long time ago. So when we move on to episode three, and this is really where my favorite part of the talk is. These are my HIPAA compliant theories of application development. 
the baseline of this is privacy by design. That means that everything we do from start to finish is coded into it, privacy. Privacy, 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 privacy. And the way this privacy by design works is that instead of having to opt into privacy settings, you're automatically in and you have to opt out. So instead of always sharing everything, you only share what you choose. You're actually given the choice from the beginning. And if you don't choose anything, your information stays private. And frankly, this is the way a lot of the rest of the world works. The European Union has huge privacy by design statutes across the continent that talk about your information is yours and it has to stay yours and it will always be yours unless you want to share it. So think about this. When you're, when you're developing that product or you're developing those things, instead of always having to opt in, make it an opt out. When you're designing a server with a client database, mayhaps use data silos. It's so common in the InfoSec industry to use data silos, but so few companies really use them. And a lot of times what happens is the InfoSec person says, we should really use data silos. The CEO goes, well, that sounds really expensive. We should really use data silos. And Anthem is really going to wish they had used data silos when it comes to all these class action lawsuits, which have already been given the go ahead to start going after them. So use data silos where you can. Your employee data should never be mixed with client data. Your insurance information, at your, on, even at a company level, shouldn't be mixed with your employment information. Those types of things should always be kept separate in isolated areas of the server or even in physically different servers in your rack. Because, again, if there's anything we've learned over the past two days, you are going to be attacked, you are going to be hacked, you are going to be breached. Full stop. If you think you aren't, you're wrong. So we have to prepare that if someone gets in, how do we stop them from giving up the entire castle? How do we give them these things? I know companies now, small to medium companies, who are setting up their own honeypots. That's genius. So a small company, instead of having all their information just out there and obvious, they set up honeypots all around it. So that hackers do get stuff, but they don't get the real stuff. And then they identify where these vulnerabilities are. They set up dummy data sets inside these honeypots that look just like their real stuff. And they're like, how did they get in? Oh, wow, we missed this over here? Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and patch that on the real thing. So using those types of things will help you. Soup to nuts security. Soup to nuts security is that every meeting, every time you're in there talking about a product, IT development, new product, a new office, you're thinking about security from beginning to end, birth to death of any product, any piece of PHI you've got, it's always there. I walked into a client's office like, yeah, well, we're moving offices, and these people are going to go over here, and these people are going to go over here, and it's going to be great, and then everybody's going to go over here. And they didn't think about that these people couldn't see what these people could see. Literally, they're going to be in the same office walking by each other in a room that's like 20 by 20. No one thought about it. So the privacy impact assessments, the security impact assessments, there are companies out there that will do these for you. They will come in, and it basically it's a mini audit. They're usually pretty quick five to 10 hours, but someone comes in from the outside looking in and says, you know, this is not what this should be. Because again, internal audits fail because we want to see the best in ourselves. So we need these third party people to come in. The next one is FI shreds or data shreds. So the way that I think about this is, is that if I send a clinician out in the field with a laptop, first off, it's encrypted, no matter what. Even if I'm using a, even if I'm using a remote desktop, uh, a VM, Microsoft Remote Desktop, anything like that. It's always encrypted. But one of the things we see time and again are that people send laptops out into the field or desktops that have full client databases. Full client databases. There was a theft about three years ago where someone walked into the front desk of a, of a doctor's office, ripped the desktop off, and ran. There were a million and a half client records live on that unencrypted machine. That company is now in settlement negotiations for a billion to a billion and a half dollars for one machine. The state of Alaska has the dubious honor of being the first state to be fined by the Office of Civil Rights. Someone decided that it'd be a good idea to give someone a flash drive with 30,000 client records, unencrypted, no password, fell out of their briefcase, disappeared. That was $1.25 million flash drive. Amazingly enough, Alaska was also the second state to be fined by the Office of Civil Rights for another violation, almost identical. So Alaska, kind of failing the HIPAA game, 
but take it as a gr with a grain of salt because that that concept of putting full records out there, let's shift off of that. So let's think about it like this. If I'm a clinician and I'm going out into the field, I've got eight hours, best case scenario, I see five to 10 people, if I'm lucky. Probably closer to four or five. First off, I only need those four or five records. I don't need everybody else's. So I get those four or five records, I go out, I go out into the field, I see the first person. Once I'm done, there's no reason for that record to be on the machine anymore. It's just a threat, it's a risk. So I go out, I put in my information, concurrent documentation for the win, I click save, and the server pulls that one off and I've only got four records left. I go to the next one, it pulls that one off, I've got three records left. By the end of the day, I've got nothing left on that machine. Because I can't tell you how many times I deal with people who've lost laptops. And it's always wonderful to say, well, there was nothing on it. Nothing, what do you mean nothing? Well, you had a remote desktop, nothing was stored locally. And the client that was light, that was there in case you went off the internet, everything got pulled off the second you hit send. So when you left your laptop in the car so you could unload your groceries because you didn't want your milk to go bad, and someone walked up and grabbed it, it doesn't matter. It's an insurance issue. It's a training issue. It's not a HIPAA breach. I'm not having to go to the OCR and say, well, I lost, I lost a laptop with 30,000 client records. Or someone social engineered me. There was a facility, a uh, government facility, Maryland, where someone walked in in an IT shirt, said, I'm with IT, where's your server cabinet? They walked in, found five unencrypted laptops with tens of thousands of records. Said, oh, I'm here to pick these up. Walked right out the door. So if you never have that stuff there, you never have to worry about it. So you keep these, the littlest amount of information you can on it. And if you code this in from the beginning, it gets easy. Then your products just work that way. So the last step, last thing I talk about a lot on my blog, are third-party compliance tools. So there's compliance consulting, really helpful, really expensive, really cheap, wide array in between. It's just like pen testing. You've got people that will say, I'll pen test you for $500. You have people also, it's 100,000, it's 200,000, it's 500,000. Do your research, talk to people in the field, find out who is worth using. Third-party analysis, that's companies like Parameter, that's companies like Palo Alto, that's companies that come in and they do these third-party pen tests routinely. You should be doing a full pen test every single year, minimum. I know companies who do them on a quarterly basis now. They just have a permanent white and black box in their racks, always pounding, and they pay a flat rate per month for that service. NIST. NIST does amazing things. If you go to my blog, there is a link to the NIST, uh, the NIST security rule analysis toolkit. This thing is ugly. It is really not pretty, but it is amazing. It has almost a thousand questions that allows you to create an exportable report. It'll say, do you have a policy about this? Well, no, I don't. Well, yes, I do. We'll upload it right here. What are your comments about this? What's the threat con of this? What value do you have on this and how soon do you need to work on it? And it gives you a way to organize the incredibly complex security rule into one report. You can just click print and it'll say, this is everything you have, everything you need, where should it go? And it's free. There's no cost associated with it. And here's the trick. Most of the really big HIPAA compliance consulting companies, they use the same product. They just reskin it. It's amazing. Sometimes it's even the same language because it draws directly from the statute. So you have this. It's out there. The other one is the HHS, the Health and Human Services Security Risk Analysis Toolkit. This one's pretty. This one went through the Office of National Controller. It's got third party people helping with it. It's on an iPad or Windows. And you can do a live security risk analysis on a product, an office, anything you want, and create a report. And it walks you through it stem to stern. And it's all very nice and pretty and laid out. Little radial buttons. So these tools are out there. Use them. Because when the auditors come, they will ask, what did you use? How did you do your audit? How did you do it internal, third party? What did you use? Where's your documentation? The last step to any compliance program is gather your team. You need your legal team, your IT team, and your administration team all at the table with their full awesome. And then everybody has to check the egos at the door. Because there has, you have to get everybody at the table to have a real soul searching event. Why are we vulnerable in these ways? What do we need to do? 
Because the problem that I see again and again is legal says, let's create this policy and we create it and it's great and we're done, click. And IT says, what? And then administration says, well, that's too expensive. I'm glad we have the policy for it. And nobody ever talks. Nobody ever puts it together into one package. If you get everybody in the same room on a monthly basis, you will be amazed at how easy this compliance stuff gets once that fundamental framework is laid. Because with everybody in the same room, legal can go, well, I think we should do the really expensive thing. And IT should go, I think we should do the really complicated IT thing. And administration should go, we shouldn't do anything. We don't have the money for it. And then you find a way to get the legally compliant thing, the IT solution, and a fiscally responsible toolkit. Because I can tell you what, it is prepare now or pay later. Because these people at the Office of Civil Rights, they are nasty. I mean, you talk about the social engineering talks we heard yesterday. They have people who go out dressed as bug, bug sprayers. Full badges with compliance of the companies that they are mocking or using, mocking up. There we go. And they'll say, I'm here to spray for bugs. If you don't challenge them and they get in, their next step is to find a USB port. Their next step is to find an office, is to find an office where the computer's not locked. There was an individual who shall remain nameless who got into a high level financial institution into a vice president's office, got them to log in and leave. I gotta work on your computer for a while. The Office of Civil Rights is all these dirty tricks and more, and they are coming. If you have someone in your office that you can work with on this, start to leverage them, because the Office of Civil Rights really is starting these compliance efforts in full right now. So any questions? Well, so for a long time, everybody thought the literal I was, the less attention I attracted. And that's really wrong. What they're doing now is they're doing random selections out of national clearing houses for employee plans, healthcare plans, clearing houses, whatever. So it's not, the, the, the random audits of 10%, they are literally creating an algorithm that just selects them out of the databases. And, they're, and the thing is, they're not just using one database, they'll use three or four. So unfortunately, Smaller is not better. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, lawyers are good. I mean, that's really the only way you can do it. Um, there, there's, um, when you get an agreement with somebody uh, or you're going to work with somebody, include language in there that says, I'm going to tell you what to do to get as close to compliant as you can. If you choose not to do this, this is not on me, this is on you. And it's, it's tough, but unfortunately, you have to get the lawyers involved to protect yourself. Um, not all lawyers are bad. I'm a lawyer. Hold the booze and hisses till the end, please. But the best way is get a really good lawyer who can draft an agreement that will cover that type of thing. Because it, it, frankly, it happens a lot. Companies don't really want to hear. I mean, 65% of the covered entities in the United States don't have an EMR. Like, that's just, that, that's mind blowing. They, these people just do not want to do it. There are major hospital networks that don't have a privacy officer or a cogent HIPAA compliance program. It just doesn't happen. The IT doesn't even know who the privacy officer is, and the security officer doesn't even know what HIPAA is. So it's out there. It's scary. But you know, lawyers will help shield you from some of that. Yes. So cyber insurance. A long time ago, it was really tough to get. You can now get cyber insurance policies that will cover you from stem to stern, from extortion to breaches to uh, you know Anthem, I believe tried to get cyber insurance policy, but the cyber insurance will cover everything. Reporting, um, sending out letters, credit monitoring, the whole bit. It's hard to get, but you can get it. Anybody else? All right, thank you so much.
Hey now. Give it up for Hudson Harris. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, I didn't announce at the beginning, but uh, the, there is a cash bar behind us, so feel free to grab anything if you need it or want it. 